All right, good morning. Welcome to West Valley Center for Spiritual Living. My name is Reverend Clyde Goins, and I am the assistant minister here. And I want to welcome you here on this beautiful Sunday morning. And um, I was telling the, the Bradfords last weekend that the song, and some of you guys are, weren't here last weekend, but the, their opening song that they sang last week, I was feeling a little sexy here in church. <laughs> you know, I was like, wow, this has got me, this got me going a little bit. So, um yeah, so, and, and I'm just going to put a little plug in. We're, we're going to have a Halloween party costume, sh- Big Bang, and um, they're actually going to be, Bradford's actually, and their band are actually going to be playing for her, so it's going to be a lot of fun. I'm already excited about it, so. There will be dancing. Yes. So, anyways, um, I'm just so grateful that we have them as our musicians. So, all right. Um, I'm the grateful one, though. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so uh, before we get started on, on the announcements, I have one important announcement, and um, Karen is going to come up and share with you her information about her workshop coming up. Hi, everybody. Um, first of all, I would like to thank the board for hearing all of my crazy ideas, because I do have them. They keep me up at night. Um, I am an artist. I'm working as an artist now, which is really exciting. Um, Reverend Karen said, how can we bring art to our center? And I said, I'm your girl. So um, the workshops that I have put together are on a sheet that looks like this. They're in the bookstore. And how many of you practice art? How many of you want to practice art? And how many of you are ready to let go of any judgment that you might have? Yes. So this is, um, you need no experience to come play with me. And while I'm up here, um, the board approved my idea to do a mosaic on the bathroom floor back here. So I am looking for dishes, pottery, flat plates, um, and platters. So uh, the first class will be August 8th here. It's called Mixed Media Color Wheel. And we will have fun doing collage and learning about color. Okay, so come play with me. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. I'm, I'm really excited. I, I love art, and I, I always feel that when you are playing with art in any form, it's, that's, you're dancing with the divine. So um, I just have to share a quick story with you, and I'm going a little bit long, but um, really quick. So there is a holy mountain here in Phoenix, and, um, and I experience that holy mountain a lot. And now, my, not yet, not yet, my dog Axel experiences it with me. And this, this mountain is, um, it's the right, the hike is the right length, it's, it, you know, for me to go get through it. It's, it's the right difficulty. So no matter what I feel like when I'm starting, how I feel when I finish, that's why I call it the Holy Mountain. And so here's a picture of what I feel like, what Axel and I feel like when we finish the hike. <laughs> we are very relaxed. <laughs> All right, so that is that's that was my spiritual practice yesterday. So if anybody wants to hike my holy mountain with me, you let me know and we can hike it together. I'll be happy to share it with you. So we come together every Sunday to remember our truth that we're whole, perfect, and complete just the way we are. That our life is unfolding in divine right order, and we are guided by that divine wisdom. So I know that today is no different, and I just welcome all of you as we come together and support one another through this beautiful journey called life. So we'd like to start off by saying our vision statement. So if you can say that with me. We are a loving, joy-filled community honoring the many paths to God as we learn and live the science of mind principles. And so it is. So just sit back, relax, open up your hearts and minds for the Bradford's beautiful opening music of meditation and Reverend Karen's beautiful message. Thank you. So just take a deep breath. We're going into that place where the divine resides. I will make a quiet place. 
quiet place within my heart and I will wait upon the Lord wait upon the Lord be still my soul be still be still my soul be still be still and know I will make a quiet place A quiet place within my heart And I will wait upon the Lord Wait upon the Lord Be still my soul, be still Be still my soul, be still be still and know I will make a quiet place A quiet place within my mind And I will wait upon the Lord Wait upon the Lord I will make a quiet place Be still and know that God is right here in this place. Be still and know that God is the ever-present, everlasting, divine spirit, sweet spirit of love and joy and community. That God that resides in each one of us here today, knowing that God is living divinely in each one of us in this space. And I'm so grateful for this, this opportunity to be here in this place, sharing the space with every member of this community and all of those who are watching online. We are all the divine expressions of God living in this one space. And I speak a word of blessing on behalf of the Bradfords, knowing that their music just touches our hearts and souls. And for all of those in service today and everyone in this community and those who are not here with us today, and a word of blessing for Reverend Karen, knowing that her words are the words of God that speak through her, as her, and that we are here to, to receive the divine message of God through Reverend Karen. And a word for all of those other faith traditions, knowing that there is only one path to there are many paths to the one God. And with great gratitude, I release my words into the law, knowing that it is already done. It is so, and so it is. My reading today is from Oneness, Great Principles Shared by All Religions. And it's from a section called, Follow the Spirit of the Scriptures, Not the Letter. Individual religions, like different nations and cultures, have unique characteristics. But these characteristics are only the surface aspects. The fundamental principles at the heart of all religions, like those at the core of all cultures and nations, are universal. For this reason, the letter of the law, or the surface meaning found in the words of the teachings, are not as integral as the spirit of the law, which is universal and shared by all religions and cultures. 
Let's take a moment to contemplate those words. And so it is. This song goes back to my roots of musical theater, and it's written by Stephen Sondheim, my favorite composer. It's called Our Time. Something is stirring, shifting ground. It's just begun. Edges are blurring all around, and yesterday is done. Feel the flow, hear what's happening, hear what's happening. Don't you know? Where the names in tomorrow's papers, it's up to us now to show them. It's our time, breathe it in. Worlds to change and worlds to win. Our turn coming through. Me and you. quivers on the brink everything gives you the shivers makes you think there's so much stuff to sing and you and me will be singing it like the birds me with music and you with words tell them things they don't know Thank you, Bradfords. Kathy, that was really beautiful. I haven't heard that before, and it was really a joy to hear you express yourself like that. Good morning. You know, something interesting I observed, that guitar doesn't sound like, uh, that's not the guitar you usually have, I'm going to guess. Uh, I, I switch around. He switches around. He has a lot of toys. <laughs> but because it sounded different, you sang different in that we we sing that song every Sunday the opening song that we set the tone in that sacred way and it pulled something different out of you and perhaps you were anticipating this you know you don't usually do a, a show tune but man that was really beautiful thank you so much we're really grateful good morning good morning everybody online it's wonderful to see you I'm 
I'm Reverend Karen Rice, and I am the spiritual leader of the West Valley Center, and I'm really happy to be here today, and uh, I met several new people this morning already, and that was fun. I'm talking today about words. I'm talking about the way we use language to communicate and connect and, um, and, and sort of um, 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 join in this experience of life. And words are, are really quite powerful. They say there are 7,000 languages. I got this from a book by Mark Nepo, which means there must be 7,000 ways to listen. Isn't that a beautiful thought? And we're looking today at the power of this spoken word. I actually uh, originally entitled this, uh, this message uh, after a T.S. Eliot poem. There's a line in a poem where I read when I was collecting my talk titles last fall. Um, he, he talks about last year's language in a relationship to how life is always evolving and changing and that so as we change, so do the words we use um, get altered and, and change as well. So I, um, I kind of at the last minute thought this is more a message about the language we use and the power of the spoken word. So we're talking about words that we speak, words that we write. We're, gonna, we're looking at the written word as well as the words of the thoughts that we think because all of those are powerful expressions of, um, of who we are and, um, and the way we pray and the way we talk to ourselves and the way we talk to each other, all of these things really matter to us. So I have been, this is a really fun topic for me because, you know, I always do some research to go along with whatever I'm doing. And I, I've noticed that that really is true, that the meanings of words change. Have you noticed that? To every now and then I stumble onto something that doesn't quite mean what it used to mean. And sometimes it's really funny. And um, I, uh, I, I was talking to my sister. I have one sibling, and she lives in Michigan. And I was talking to her on this video chat that we do on a regular basis. And I said, do you remember when... And mom used to call fabric softener cream rinse. Did anybody else call it cream rinse? Like, yeah. And we also called the hair conditioner, we also called that cream rinse. So, you know, now we're a little, you know, we, we've cleaned up that language so that when I, so I continue to say, Oh, I need to, I need to, I'll ask my daughters. I bought too much cream rinse. Do you guys need some extra? Anybody need some cream rinse? And they'll go, what, what, it, what are you talking about, mom? You know, so the meanings of words change. And, um, you know, they, I've said this before in here, but, you know, they are always adding words to the dictionary. And that will always be the truth about words and our language because it's alive. And so it'll never be done. They'll never, we'll never discover all the words. There will always be more words that uh, come to us that we begin to use in our languaging. Some words fade away. Others um, take on new meaning. And, um, and um, do you ever wonder who decides what words get in the dictionary? Well, they actually have a, it's a job. So, I mean, you can't just go out and get it. You have to have lots of degrees, and you have to n know a lot about language and words and, and English. You know, you have to s usually been an English major somewhere in your life. But uh, they call it, if you, if, you, if you are one of those people that decides what words go in and out of the dictionary, you are a lexicographer. You are a lexicographer. I personally don't really ever want to be. I love to make up my own words, have you noticed? You know, I, I, ha I like to make up my own words. I like to shake things up every now and then. But sometimes what I'm trying to say, just I can't find the right word. And so I do something else with a combination of words and create my own thing. And sometimes it sticks and usually it doesn't. But the lexicographer is looking at the language that is being spoken at a time, at any given time. When they're, when they're considering what new words go in the dictionary. So it's not that they're telling us what words are real words and what words are not real words. It's that we are telling them. 
So what they do is they pay attention to the words being used. They peruse all the different avenues of communication. They listen to the speeches or they read the transcripts from the speeches. They, um, they, they watch the, the local newscasters. They pay attention to the written word. What are we reading now? And they discover at some point that when a word is being used by lots of people, and they all agree on the meaning, they're all using it in the same context, then they might be on to something. But the final decision happens if they believe there will be um, a, a lasting significance to the word. Is it going to stick around? And once they make that decision, it looks like it's going to be around, um, then it, it enters the, the one of the, the dictionaries. So... Webster was one of the first lexicographers, and, um, and there are lots and lots of them today, and they don't always agree, but eventually we, 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 tell, we tell the dictionary editors what those words are going to be by the way we use words and language. I googled a, an article on the evolution of language. Did you hear what I just said? I googled I googled and you know what everybody here probably knew exactly what I meant I did it I did a, I used a search engine I looked for what I could find on the evolution of language I googled it and Google as of 2000 and uh, 2006 was officially in the Webster Miriam Miriam Webster dictionary in 2006 you know who used it first and who popularized the term I googled it was first heard in 2002 on um, Buffy the Vampire Slayer. <laughs> and it went over so well on Buffy that we started, we picked it up and people start using it. And then by 2006, it Google, the, you know, when you Googled something, I don't know about you, but I wasn't Googling yet. I was still asking Jeeves. Do you remember Jeeves? Did anybody else start on Jeeves? Jeeves was a butler, right? I see some hands. A butler, and he, oh. <laughs> and he wore a, a little towel over his hand. And eventually, it wasn't politically correct anymore, and they dropped it, it down to ask. Ask.com, and I don't even know if they're still in existence now, because now we all Google. And you know what? We don't even all Google. Sometimes, even if I'm on Bing, because I've gone in through Microsoft and it takes me to Bing instead of Google, I still call it Google in the same way we still call tissue Kleenex. You know, so there are certain uh, words that we pick up and we use and it means something, but once it has that universal connection, then now we've made something. In the last 20 years, oh, by the way, in that article I read, I looked up, <laughs> this is so good. <laughs> Do you know you can look up the year you were born and see what words were added to the dictionary in that year? You know what one of my words was for the year I was born? Stilettos. <laughs> Is that perfect? So if you're here visiting for the first time, they're all laughing because I love high heels and the majority of the high heels in my closet, and I have quite a number of them, are stilettos. <laughs> so um, yeah, so that's just really, isn't that fun? Um, you know, when you're, Hugh and I used to always have an Oscar party, and before computers, I, uh, I forget how I looked, I think I looked it up on the computer, but I hand wrote everything out. I think we, computers were new when I did this. And I took the, uh, through all the history of Oscars, now you can just print a list out, but th at that time it was a lot of work, it was a lot of l intensive labor, and I made a list of all the movies for all the years, so when people came in, I had this little box, and they could pull their movie horoscope, and there were a number of professional readers that were at the party, and they would tell you what the movies meant, how, and how they showed up in your life, and it was so fun, so um, it's, it's telling, isn't it, stilettos. Stiletto was a new word in the dictionary with the year I was born, just in the nick of time. Um, so I brought uh, a, a list, I made a list uh, over the weekend of words that are younger, that are not, that words that have been added to the dictionary in the last 20 years. And I brought seven of them. 
Now I'm going to name the seven words and I want you to use your fingers for every word where you know what it means, put out a finger and count and then we'll see how many of the seven you actually know what they mean, okay? So, uh, so the first word is selfie. Pull a finger if you know what selfie is. The second word is emoji. Not in the dictionary 20 years ago. Binge watch. Pandemic, I became a binge watcher. <laughs> Netflix. Hashtag. Here's one that we do battle with. Auto suggest. <laughs> How many texts have you sent that, uh, uh, auto, uh, that the, your smartphone thought you meant something you didn't mean? Um, here's number six is unfriend. <laughs> it's actually in the dictionary now. Um, and my favorite one, photo bomb. <laughs> so if you got all seven, raise your hand. Let me see how many of you got. Oh my gosh. <laughs> wow. That, that's impressive. Um, did anybody get less than three? Nobody in the room, at least nobody's admitting it. <laughs> So we know these words, and all of those words are in the dictionary. And you know, one of the words, it's actually a term that I read. This reminded me of Sue Witter. Um, um, th that was just added last year, or this year or last year. Uh, that's a hard no. <laughs> I've heard Sue Witter say that. That's a hard no. Oh, uh, so I don't know where you pick up all this stuff. Where did we learn all this? But we know all this now, right? These are all terms that are pretty familiar to us because the times change, um, and you don't have to change with the times, but, um, but we change anyway. I have this beautiful quote that comes from the Tao Te Ching. Uh, 24, almost 2,500 years ago, uh, in this beautiful ancient wisdom, it says, it is because of definitions that we limit ourselves. 2,500 years ago. It's the way that we define things that we now begin to make our world smaller. And I've read uh, many things in, in poetry. John O'Donohue, a favorite of mine, often uh, reminds me that when I take a walk in a, maybe a new region of the country that I've never lived in before, so I'm visiting my sister in Michigan, I don't know anything about the, uh, the, the greenery and the plant life and, and all of that in Michigan, and so I can have a beautiful tree take my breath away that I don't recognize. But if you live in a region, John O'Donohue says that the, the more you, you, you would seek to learn the name of it, and that once you learn the name of it, you never walk by it with that same sense of awe again, right? It gets, it gets replaced with its familiar. First, it's just, oh, that's great. I know that that's an ash. I didn't know that when I first moved here, and now I know that's an ash. That's how I feel about living in the desert. You know, I didn't know what a Palo Verde was. Now they sprout up everywhere in your yard. They free root if you're not careful, of, you know. So um, that once you name it, we begin to diminish the awe of it, and that's what that means. In fact, last week I used a similar quote. I, I spoke of the way Carl Jung uh, says... Um, when you, uh, literalism, too much literalism kills our spiritual instinct. Now that expands my understanding. That tells me that there's, there's that knowing, that inner knowing in us, that God be still and know be still and know God. And um, if I take life too literally, or I want a religion that tells me what everything means, and I'm supposed to believe it exactly the way it's told, it just it starts to kill my own spiritual instincts. Right? We we sort of go to sleep around it. So um, there's always something new. Um, and then the other thing that happens with words, and this is a big issue with communication, and we all know about this, is that we. <laughs> We interpret things differently. You know, I can be having a talk with, with president of the board, and I can think I have done a really good job communicating an idea I have. 
Um, or the other way around, I notice that uh, this happens between me and Reverend Clyde a lot. He'll have an idea, but it's his idea, and so I'm not able to articulate it as well as he is because it's being born, it's emerging through him. So when I'm trying to talk to, um, when Ed was a brand new president, it was, it was like we had to learn each other's language, wasn't it? I can see he's like, yeah, totally. It's such a good example. So I think I'm being clear and he thinks he understands, he doesn't even know what to ask for more clarity because he thinks he he's understands it. But then later, um, you know, down the road somewhere, we go, no, we'd, I had that, we said, we thought, we decided, you know, but no, we didn't because we weren't on the same page. But we don't have any way of knowing we're not on the same page. And so life is a brilliant, beautiful example of how words have meaning and power and that we could almost never have enough clarification and that we shouldn't take it too literal. That Ed and I, I think, the, one of the greatest things we did was we learned to soften up a little bit and not take it as, um, as seriously as, as we did in the, you know, when we were learning how to relate to each other. So Ernest Holmes is a great um, interpreter of words. In fact, he has a big old, in the back of the Science of Mind textbook is a very thick glossary that uh, most people don't even know it's there. You could look up surprising things in the back of that book and see how he defines them so that you can have a better understanding of our spiritual teaching. Now, one of the things towards the, in the front of the book, one of the things I stumbled on when I was getting ready to prepare this message was a, a chapter, it's actually on page 64, I happen to remember that, um, that uh, he, Ernest Holmes is telling us his interpretation of the creation story, the story in the book of Genesis that talks about how all things came to be. And so Holmes starts uh, his uh, descriptive, his, he's going to tell us his version of that story, and he says, let us restate the story in our own words. I can hear him speaking. Let us restate the story in our own words, and I'm immediately thinking, no, those are your words. <laughs> I don't think they're my words, but I'm certainly interested in what you have to say, which is really the key to all communication, to be curious, to be interested. Um, so he tells this whole story of creation, his version of, of, the, of the biblical explanation of, 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 of how life got to be, came to be, and he tells it in terms of how humanity became conscious, how consciousness came to be on the planet. So specifically now, we see there's a story of creation in the seven days. And there's actually two versions in the book of Genesis, and they're written in, you can tell they could not have had the same author because the languaging is so different, one from the other. Um, but he's taking the story of the physical creation in the seven days, and he's applying it for us to understand how consciousness works and how our lives become the, the way they are. So he says that uh, it starts that in the very beginning, there's God. You know, in the beginning, God. First, there's God, this supreme uh, intelligence of all the universe, and God desires creation. And God is constantly, therefore, creating. And there comes a point where God desires, God creates the earth, God creates the plant life, God creates the animal life and the birds and the sky and the fish and the sea. And then there's a desire on the part of God to have uh, 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 a, a consciousness. Uh, uh, God desires to create a being, us, us, of us, a being who can respond, that God can interact with. You know, God's, God wants us to be cr in creation. And, and, um, and Holmes also says to respond and to understand him, that is to say God. So God made man from the essence of himself and clothed this subtle essence with definite form. Voila, physical body. And there we are. So it's a story. He goes on to say, 
Um, and, and, and God decides that this being, us humans, must be spontaneous, not automatic, not, um, not automated like some sort of puppetry. In other words, we will have choice, we will have free will, and that is the desire on the, uh, the part of God for the way we are to be. Um, and humankind will have dominion over everything less intelligent and shall name everything. Okay, so he's talking, Ernest Holmes is using this, in this reference that this is the word, that the power of God's word, the power of God's thought, the power of God's desire to have this relationship with something, some being that can respond to God then becomes humanity. So this whole idea of the word as Jesus now becomes a bigger story. Yes, Jesus, but we are, Jesus is the elder son, the elder brother, the, the elder brother, not son. J Jesus is the son of God as we are sons and daughters of the divine, all created in the image and likeness of God. And so God gives us dominion and then we name everything, and we name everything in our lives, right? You have an experience, you move through a condition, and you tell a story about it. First, you tell the story to yourself, like, what the hell was that? <laughs> Why did that happen? What did I do that, that made this happen? How could I do this different? Th and you, so you start tearing it apart. You start um, analyzing it so that you can have an understanding of it and that you can participate in your future choices so you don't repeat the ones you don't want to have repeated. And you can repeat the stuff that you enjoyed creating in your life. But you are naming it all. To name something is to call out the nature of it. So we are always naming things in our life. Um, we're naming things good or bad. We're naming our day productive or not so productive. We're naming what's important and what doesn't feel as, in import as important. And as we then put that name on those circumstances around us, they are our truth. But just as words in the dictionary change, we too can change the words we tell ourselves. And that's what Holmes is trying to communicate to us when he's telling us this story of creation, the creation of consciousness, because we are in charge of monitoring our own consciousness. We have the opportunity to be conscious and in in actual choice of our life as much as we, uh, as much as we want to. And so he tells us this beautiful story of how we create reality in our own lives. And then he goes on, and this is how he ends it. And this was actually going to be my original, this is the quote I used in my, uh, little, in my little blog this week. Then he says, The reader need not be startled by this rather human narrative. Remember, we are putting into human language a story which can only be imagined. And so for me, that sounds like he's sort of saying, it's just my interpretation. Don't take it too literal. What if there's just another way of looking at this so that we can own some of the power of our word and we can begin to change our lives? In the beginning, God, right? We're created in the image and the likeness. If that's how all creation came to be, no matter what version of the story you're looking at, in the beginning, God, that's where we start. As we want to empower ourselves and have some control over the circumstances of our life, we remember in the beginning there is a power and a presence that is greater than I am, and I can align to it, and I can use it, and I can remember it and speak about it and live my life aligned to it. One supreme being, one creator, and I am imitating the act of creation in all of my choices every day and all the time. So it starts... It starts with the word, starts with a thought, it starts with a desire, and we are always creating and participating in the circumstances uh, and conditions of our own life. 
we use the very same power of the word that God used to bring all things into creation. We use the very same power. This is a, a big uh, a big spiritual idea. It's a little tricky to wrap your, your mind around it, but there's something important, and it is emphasized in this teaching. We um, look at this idea of carefully considering the words we choose to use in our, in our everyday uh, thinking. We have a, a strong um, um, knowledge of how powerful affirmative prayer is. We learn to use affirmations. We learn to, to argue away any inconsistencies through the powerful words of prayer and to change our mind so that we can realign ourselves to that divine flow of life. But we're always creating. The word becomes flesh right? Our spoken word. When we are speaking the words of prayer, we are calling something into being. We are calling forward a change. We are calling forward something with substance that allows us to change our mind and to change our vision and to in, in expand our, our beliefs in our conscious mind so that our consciousness can rise even as something on this planet is desiring to emerge through us, it can only be here through us, and then we can all join together from a higher view and a different perspective. So um, it's a lot to think about. We are more powerful than we realize. Here's a quote from Don Miguel Ruiz, you know, the, our favorite, uh, the four agreements, everybody if you haven't read it, don't miss it. Don't, don't, don't go to sleep before you've read this book. This is such a lovely book and always a good reminder. Don Miguel Ruiz, the word is not just a sound or a written symbol. The word is a force. It's the power you have to express and communicate, to think, and to thereby create the events in your life. It's the most powerful tool you have as a human. He's not a religious scientist. You know, he didn't study this. Well, he might have. But, but look at the, the beautiful languaging of the very same story. Our words have power. Our words are, have force in them. So how are you thinking? How are you speaking? And, and how are you, therefore, being in, in this thing called life? All of the great experts and the researchers and the people that study and teach about human behavior, um, they align and agree with everything the mystics have spoken of for hundreds of years. The, those mystics being the, the spiritual deep thinkers um, who have pondered uh, all, of, all of these things for forever, as long as man, man, humankind has been able to reason on anything. So what, what we know is that your life reflects what you believe, right? We know, and we know that our beliefs are always changing, that we can, you know, but we have to participate. Otherwise, our beliefs will carry us down any old road that feels or smells or looks like what we think we believe. So we're always refining that. We're always participating at the level of choosing and, and, and reasoning and, and thinking and exposing ourselves to new ideas, not just the same old stuff. Um, change the channel once in a while. Watch something different. Watch a different perspective. Talk to people that don't agree with your opinions and see if you can behave yourself. <laughs> There's an experiment for you. Because the bottom line is there really are no right or wrong beliefs. See, I can't, I'm not going to stand here and tell you what you should or should not believe. You get to do that all on your own. Um, the reality is, however, that we are always naming 
the things in our life and therefore calling the nature of those names more prominently into our life. So are you naming things in a way that pleases you or not? Because if you're not liking the way your life looks or the way the world looks, it starts with the way we change our own mind and, and, uh, and then strengthen those new ideas. I think that life is more like a course of study. It's, you know, like school, earth school, I hear people say sometimes. And what that means is that we are constantly putting more pieces into the puzzle of our understanding. And sometimes the whole course of our life can change when we get a piece that we weren't expecting. Uh, I know that certainly happened in my life this year. Um, And yet I'm still building the story but I've had to change the story radically. And I found out that I can, you know, I figured out that I've got a little more oomph than I ever thought I had. So I'm, I want us to participate in that, in that way where we're conscious and we're working and we're choosing and, um, and we are, we are applying this in every way imaginable because it shows up in, in every way. For instance, what you believe about your childhood will be the truth you live and an essential part of your story, and yet you always have the power to change it. You change the way you relate to it. What you believe about your neighborhood, what do you believe about your neighborhood? Your neighborhood has changed radically since I first met you. You didn't have neighbors, and now there are homes in rows built near you. I mean, I know you still have a lot of space, but you gotta, you've got to have some opinions about that, right? And, um, and some of them will be favorable, and some of them may not be favorable. So what do you believe about the place you live, and most of all, about the world? So we're personalizing that stuff all the time. Um, What do you believe about the price of gas? (laughs) Right? So I just want you to see it's a really big, you know, you can use this in every every direction. Uh, We are imparting the nature of our belief in all the circumstances we experience in every way. The study of spiritual ideas or principles is so valuable in helping us balance out our life. The study of spiritual ideas helps us to find order in in a very disordered, crazy time in the history of humankind because essential truths do not change. God is just as powerful and present as ever. Are we aware of that? And are we, you know, I mean, technically we should be growing every day. So are you more aware of it today than you were yesterday? That's a real, that's a really good question. Here's a quote from Emma Curtis Hopkins, uh, my most beloved Christian mystic, um, and Ernest Holmes. She is one of the three primary influences that Dr. Ernest Holmes studied under, and he had great respect for her. And here's what she said in one of her books. If the tongue is still speaking of hardships, its owner has not sensed the presence of God. (laughs) If the tongue in your mouth is still telling horrible stories about stuff that doesn't make you feel good, then you probably have not sensed the presence of God lately, right? And you know what will change it in a minute? Sensing the presence of God. So get in that sitting chair. Be still and know God so you can remember, you can reconnect to this greater truth. And then she goes on to say this. She's so great. Don't you just want to study her? Don't you want, don't want to understand her as, like I do? So you could, uh, She's so good. Then she says, let your speech and your thought express your faith constantly. Let your speech and your thought, what you think about, so how did God create? God had a, had a, has an idea that speaks the word, has the thought, sees the image, has the desire, and then we call it into being. We name it. We call it. We bring it forward. So express your faith constantly. She, she, her, her big lesson is always um, God, you know, is good. 
and there is a good for you and you ought to have it and it's God. Can we open ourselves to be aware of the presence of God in our life? Because as much as we want it, it wants us. So if there's any sense of being wooed by the Holy Spirit, and there is, especially if you're me, (laughs) that's a real important part of my spiritual practice, um, then we want to get in that space and open ourselves for that greater uh, experience of our very own godness. Emma had a formula, it's, and it's, you know, it's there, she builds each of her lessons. Every book she wrote, is, there's 12 lessons, and they're the same 12 lessons they repeat, and she deepens in different ways. And once you get a little more than halfway in, she, 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 well, each lesson builds on the next lesson, and then she reveals that it's time for you to write a covenant to God. You write a covenant. You make a covenant with God and you write it down. So the covenant is what you believe about God. What do you believe about God? What would you write right now? Think about it. What would you write if I asked you to write down what you believe about God right now? What would you write? And how can you then expand those words to describe God? Because Emma would say, you tell the truth. You speak your faith and you tell the truth. You tell the truth about God. You announce it. You describe it. And then you stand by it. Whoa. You do that every day. You just do that every day. Guess how your life's going to change. So number one, tell the truth. This is your takeaway. Three simple things I'm going to tell you. Tell the truth about God. What would you write in a covenant to God? If you're going to write a letter right now, what I believe in, what I believe about God. What is that truth and how do you stand in it? And can you speak about it and describe it and announce it and have it in your mind all the time? Tell the truth um, and, and use those words. And then number two, she says, write it down. This is where you write the covenant. You write it down, write it down. She even says that if praying out loud is difficult for you, if, if it's hard for you to make affirmations, and sometimes I struggle with affirmations. You know, like I'm, I'm not a traditional, you would, you would know that if you know me, I guess. But, um, you know, I, 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 how, how, you, write it down. If it's hard for you to speak, if you're not good at praying out loud, you write it down. And then step number three is that you read what you have written down. You read it every day. You read it every day. You read it every day, and you read it out loud. So you only have to do the work once, although I would say that I do it pretty frequently. Develop a habit where you're reading something and it interests you. Stop. Rewrite it. You should see my books. You know, I rewrite right at the bo- any place there's a little, I'll turn the book sideways and write in the, you know, rewrite the, exactly what those words are. Or sometimes if I'm reading a mystic like Emma and it's a little hard to grasp, I will rewrite it in a language that I speak, that I understand. I will take her words and I will make them make meaning to me because I can feel what she felt when she wrote them. And then I reread it. Right? And I reread it, and I reread it. Maybe I even post it. You know how I tell you that. I post little notes all over, everywhere in my life where I will sit and read them. And pretty soon, you begin to embody them. So step one, tell the truth. Describe it. Step two, write some stuff down. And then step three is to read what you have written. Before I, before I started ministry school, I decided I should reread the entire Science of Mind textbook. I had about one month, and I reread the entire Science of Mind textbook, and I did it with a notebook. I, u- I actually had a virgin, unmarked copy of the textbook because I didn't want to know anything I used to believe. This is a change in my life. It was 2004. This is a change in my life. It, most of those words weren't on that list yet. We're not in the dictionary yet. <laughs> I'm changing my life, and I'm going to record where I'm at now. And I chose the best, most important quotes that touched my soul at that precious time of my life, and I made a little notebook. I took a journal, and I made a notebook of all my favorite quotes from Dr. Ernest Holmes. Write it down. Write it down. 
And you know, at any time, I can pick that up and I can read it. And now, now, I not only write at the bottom of my pages, but I keep a journal, not that I journal in, I keep a separate journal at my reading corner where I sit every morning and I just put book quotes in there, whatever book I happen to be reading, and I write it down. And then you know what? Over time, you begin to accumulate these great truths that are personal to you. So do this. Find some way to um, describe your good and write it and repeat it and all of that. You know... In January of last year, 2021, no, 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 October of, of last year, October of 2021, Bar- the Barna Group did a survey of ministers that w- they had been surveying these ministers for some time because of their, they were putting attention on the decline of church. What's happening in the world that people are not going, attending Sunday services like they used to. So they do this survey. They did it on a regular basis, but in October of 1921, 42% of the ministers surveyed admitted that they have seriously contemplated leaving ministry. And you know why? Because the world has gotten so crazy that everything we do now to put on a Sunday service is so um, 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 much more complex. You know, I, 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 I find that teaching in a hybrid setting is difficult for me. My life is more stressful. 42% of the ministers surveyed, that does not include the people that have left ministry since COVID started, and a great number of ministers have. And what they say, what they all agree on, is that part of what has made ministry so stressful is you It's that the minister can no longer stand up here and speak to you because of our beliefs and the way the world has become so divided that you will come, the only way you can come is with your beliefs and you will think I'm saying something I'm not saying at all. And you have come, people have come to me and said so. I know this to be true. And the problem is that half of the people Half is not a good number, but because, because most of you don't speak out, so I don't really know. But in the survey, this is what the ministers say across the nation. Some of the people will come to the minister and say, you are too political now. And you know what? I have not changed what I've done at all. I have not changed a thing. The world has changed. So I have different examples that I have to share with you now. But I I am not, you know, my goal is not to politicize ever. But the other half or the other group of people that have been complaining to ministers say exactly the opposite. is the world's in trouble. We should be talking more on Sunday mornings about what we can do. We need to be involved and and get our hands dirty. And you need to be preaching that way. This is a no-win situation. And so ministers are caving They're leaving in hordes. Sue Witter just started the School of Ministry almost a year ago now, right? And she tells me that there is a big concern around, probably globally, that there are, the ministers are aging out and that not enough young people are interested in taking those, in, in taking those, you know, opportunities to lead spiritual communities. So let's do what we can to realize that what we hear, that, that there's always more than what we think we hear, right? But you know how I always say this, Lord, I don't know why I say Lord, I never say Lord, but I do it when I'm telling you this story, Lord, <laughs> <laughs> show me another way of, of, of looking at this. Show me a deeper understanding of what I'm going through. Help me figure out a better way of seeing what's going on in the world and do that every day. And go back in the beginning, God, and remember that we are a part of all creation, and we most definitely are creating our own lives. I've heard it said, this is such a beautiful quote, words are but symbols of symbols, thus they are twice removed from reality. Words are but symbols of symbols. 
They're two steps away from what we were trying to say. And then you throw in the way the, pre the corporate-minded president is listening to the not very corporate at all minister who's abstract and visionary. You know, I'm a vision leader. Like, he can't relate to that. But we have to find a way to connect. And you know what? We did. It, in fact, we always did. We never didn't. We just worked through the hurdles when we were not he able to, you know, know what was really going on. Emma Curtis Hopkins said, do not get entangled in your words. Do not get entangled in your words. You are so much greater than any words you have ever spoken. Our words matter. The meaning of words <laughs> makes a difference. But remember that they're living. They're living words. So they're always changing in the same way that we are always changing. And we can always change the story of our life. In fact, right now, we are changing the story of humanity. How will you contribute that's what I wanted to say today. You're welcome. We want to pull some power in this so that we can uh, not miss the gem that's here for each and every one of us. So take a breath. Feel some love in your heart. Soften your, your, your heart so that we can open our minds and we can open our hearts and we can call in that divine wisdom and recognize that we are, are in charge of naming all of the circumstances of our very own life. So just feel the love of God in this room. Open yourself to receive the good that is here, right here. Feel that powerful presence of God that is greater than we are. We recognize that indeed we have been created in the image and the likeness of that which created us and therefore we have this amazing ability and the desire to name more goodness in our own individual lives. I feel the love of God and I know that it is a, a guiding light. It is a force for good on this planet and it can never be held down it cannot be limited in any way. Any sense of, of darkness or, or evil is, is met its match when the light comes on, then the, then the night is over and the dark is gone. And the presence of God is that power, it is that love, it is that force that restores a perfect balance in our individual lives and in the lives of all of humanity. Things naturally desire to be restored and harmonized in some perfect order. And it may be in a way that is beyond our understanding. And yet, this is the way life works. So I rejoice in naming that good, in calling forward perfect health, so that everyone at the sound of my voice is quickened in that inner way, that interior way in which there is a perfection that sparkens and enlivens within us, allowing us to shine our own divine light, allowing us to be restored to our wholeness so that the perfection is, is revealed in our living. And the same is true in our relationships. And the same is true in our finances. And the same is true in this spiritual community. So I give thanks 
that we are willing to come on a Sunday morning and expect that a, a precious gem, that we will unearth some kind of treasure from our willingness just to sit in a chair and to open our hearts and our minds and allow God to be the gift giver. And then we become the vessel to receive. For we know with great certainty that the givingness of God is always pouring. The grace of God is always streaming into our lives. The wisdom of life itself is awakened within us so that we match energetically. We match that divine movement and we can flow in the ease and the grace and the beauty of this thing called life. So I say thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, life. Thank you, infinite spirit, for this glorious day of beauty, of wisdom, of new truths and old truths awakened within us. For now we know we can do good work in the world and that that good returns to us unbounded, set free, overflowing. Thank you, God. I release these words and I let it be. And together we say, and so it is. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Bradford. We are grateful. Um, so a, a really quick announcement. Um, John wants me to remind everybody that Dining with the Dudes is coming up, not next weekend, in a couple weeks, but he wants me to let you know now. And the reason why is because we have a lot of dudes out there, and so he wants you to sign up for what you're going to bring. So the sign-up sheet is out there So um, in, the, in, 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 um, in the bookstore area, and um, also we have a we're going to go to the escape room again. And so if you're interested in joining us on, on that um, outing, um, you can also sign up the, out there in the bookstore. So those are the two quick announcements. So now is the time to remember the, the abundance of our lives and the abundance of our community. So let's say our giving affirmation together. I live in a consciousness of good. Divine love blesses and multiplies all that I am, all that I have, all that I give, and all that I receive. Thank you, God. And so it is. Please rise for our last song.
Feels good, don't it? Feels good, don't it? Only got one life, live in the moment. Feels good, don't it? Feels good, don't it? Only got one life, live in the moment. Feels good, don't it? Feels good, don't it? Only got one life, live in the moment. Feels good, don't it? Feels good, don't it? Only got one life, live. To be alive. You, yes, it does. All right, so if you could repeat that for me, our closing affirmation. My word has power. My word has power. And I am co-creating my life. Through the power of my word. Through the power of my word. And so it is.